Right, so here's a two record set, a 12 inch 78 RPM shellac record set from the late 1920s, uh, issued by the International Educational Society, and it's uh, the stars, and it gives you the various uh, seasons for the stars. This is, um, you might think, well, discussing the stars is going to be a very dry subject, but I can assure you by the time you've uh, listened to this, you'll know more about the stars than you do now, and it's well worth a listen to. Really interesting lecture by Professor H. H. Turner, DSCFRS, uh, civilian professor of astronomy in Oxford University. As I say, it's late 1920s. These records were designed to send out to, uh, well, to the, the world, really, and sort of uh, share knowledge and uh, British things and uh, there was about, I think in all, in all there was about 80 before the uh, project uh, wound up due to lack of funds, it's the usual case in, the, in Britain unfortunately even these days. So have a listen, this, this is really wonderful, very inspirational. It does not require much watching to realise that the stars change their position in the sky during the night. They rise in the east, travel to the south, and set in the west, just as the sun does by day, and for the same reason, namely, that our Earth is turning round upon its axis once a day. Almost everyone knows that the sun rises and sets, but some people do not realize that many of the stars do the same. Why not all? Well, there are some, like the great bear, which try to set, but cannot get low enough, at any rate in England. They just circle round the pole star, getting first higher and then lower, but never low enough to reach the horizon. We will say more about the pole star and the great bear on another occasion, but at present, let us consider the stars which rise and set, and especially those which are midway between rising and setting and are seen in the south at the highest point in their nightly journey. They will not be the same at different times of year, because not only does the Earth turn round on its axis once a day, but it travels round the Sun once a year, so that its outlook on the stars is continually changing. Most of us have ridden at some time in our lives on a merry-go-round, and we remember how, as we go round, we pass different spectators in the crowd. The spectators are like the stars, and if we imagine a very bright light in the middle where the music generally plays, that would represent the sun and would prevent us from seeing the crowd behind it by dazzling our eyes. The spectators we should see best would be those on the outside, away from this dazzling light, and those who represent the stars we see at night which change as we go round, though we should lose most of the fun of the merry-go-round if we took a whole year to make one turn, as the Earth does. Sometimes when we are riding, on a merry-go-round or in a train, it appears to us as though other things were moving, and we ourselves were at rest. And this is what everyone thought about our journey round the sun not so very long ago. They thought that it was the sun that was moving, and that we ourselves on the earth were at rest. And they even thought that the earth was not turning round, but that everything, stars and all, was turning round it. Now we know that this was a mistake, and that this little earth is both spinning daily on its axis, which makes sun and stars rise and set, and also journeying yearly round the sun, which continually alters the stars we see at night until we come round again to the same ones. It is curious to think that but for the air we breathe, we should also see the stars by day in spite of the sun's great brightness. It is our air which scatters the sun's rays and makes the sky appear blue. Had the earth no atmosphere, the sky would seem as black in the daytime as on the darkest night, and would be spangled with the lovely stars just as at night except for one or two stars, which might happen to be directly behind the sun. But our atmosphere is so useful in supporting our lives that we should scarcely think it an advantage to lose it, even for the great and novel privilege of seeing the stars by day as well as by night. 
As the night goes on, they will continually be changing their places in the sky, some of them setting in the west and others rising in the east. And a little practice will make it seem easy to allow for these changes. But let us begin in a simple way by supposing that it is about nine o'clock on a spring evening. Right, uh, part two of this uh, four-part uh, two-record set of uh, t two times uh, 12 inch 78 RPM shellac records. International uh, Educational Society, The Stars, part two, Spring, and it's by H. H. Turner, a professor of uh, astronomy at Oxford University, re recorded in the late 1920s. Grandfathers knew by heart. It fell at a time of year when the face of night is fair on the dewy downs, and the shining daffodil dies, and the charioteer and starry Gemini hang like glorious crowns over Orion's grave low down in the west. This is the beautiful though rather roundabout way in which a poet tells us that it was towards the end of April when the shining daffodil dies. And he means to tell us the same thing by what he says of the stars, though it would be more complete if he had in some way mentioned the time of night, which must have been about nine o'clock. For by midnight, the starry Gemini, the bright stars Castor and Pollux, would themselves have followed Orion into his grave. You have probably heard of Gemini or the twins, as one of the zodiacal signs which the sun visits in the course of the year. Perhaps you know the rhyme, beginning the ram, the bull, the heavenly twins, and next the crab, the lion child, and so on through the twelve signs. If you do know it, it is well worth remembering. But twelve constellations always seem to me rather a lot to remember for people who are not astronomers, even with the help of the little rhyme, which, you may like to know, was made by dear old Isaac Watts when he was writing a book on astronomy. Do we easily remember the names of the twelve sons of Jacob, or even the twelve apostles? There is not much difficulty, however, in remembering four things, such as the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, or the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, and I suggest that if people will learn just four constellations, one for each season, they can probably do so quite easily. And then they will be able to add others as they feel inclined. The one to be remembered for the spring is the lion, which comes at the end of Isaac Watts's second line. It doesn't appear in Tennyson's words so far as we have gone, but the next words in his poem are as follows. They refer to the spirit of the fair girl, Maud, who had died after her brother had savagely attacked her lover and been himself killed. Like a silent lightning under the stars, she seemed to divide in a dream from a band of the blessed and spoke of a hope for the world in the coming wars. And in that hope, dear soul, let trouble have rest, knowing I tarry for thee pointed to Mars as he glowed like a ruddy shield on the lion's breast. The last line talks of the lion, the constellation which was shining high up in the south as the poet strolled on the dewy downs after dinner and which you can see at the same time of night and same season in any year. It is one of the few constellations which really look like the things which give them their name. It has four or five bright stars forming the body of the lion, one for the tail, three for the head and mane, and one for the stretched out paw as the little lion lies down. It is certainly much more like a lion than the great bear is like a bear. When you have looked at the lion in the south, you might turn round 
and look at the great bear or plow in the north, very high up. And you will see it something like a plow upside down, the two end stars pointing nearly downwards to the pole star. But accepting that the handle of the plow might be thought of as a bear's tail, there is not much to suggest a bear. Right, so uh, record two, uh, uh, part three, The Stars, Spring, by Professor H. H. Turner, Professor of, uh, of Astronomy at uh, Oxford University. As though you can always see the lion in the spring when the night is fair, you will not by any means always see Mars, as Tennyson saw it, glowing like a ruddy shield on the lion's breast. For the planets wander about among the stars, and to find where any one of them is at any particular time, we must go to an almanac. The fact that the planet Mars was in that position allows us in a very interesting way to tell not only the time of night and the time of year when Tennyson wrote those words, but also the year itself, with a little help from the allusion to the coming wars which were the Crimean Wars. We can look in our old almanacs of about that time and find out when Mars had wandered into the lion. And we find that she was on the lion's breast in the year 1854, all through April and for some days in March and May also. He was in what we call a stationary position. For a time, he had almost ceased to wander and seemed to form part of the fixed pattern of stars which make up the lion. Now this struck the poet Tennyson as something of a coincidence. The lion is the national symbol of Britain, and Mars was the god of war in old days. Seeing that Britain was soon to be at war, the Crimean War began a few months later, it seemed almost symbolic that the planet called by the name of the god of war should be for nearly two months associated with our national symbol, glowing like a ruddy shield on the lion's breast. Indeed, it arrested his attention so much that he called the sun, born to him about that time, Lionel. Probably we do not approve the view expressed in the poem that the coming wars were a hope for the world. Our recent experience of war had not tended in that direction though it may be freely admitted that wars provide opportunities for many noble actions of which Tennyson was no doubt thinking. Now let us inquire how Mars came to be so long, nearly stationary. If a planet goes steadily round the sun, we might expect it to be always on the move, steadily in one direction. Whereas it is at times stationary among the stars and then actually reverses its movement and goes the other way, so it had changed its mind. We realize now that though it goes steadily round the sun, it is because we also are making a similar journey, though at a different pace, that we see this curious behavior. If we could watch Mars from the sun, we should see him go steadily round without faltering. And our Earth too. But the Earth goes quicker than Mars and is always overlapping him and passing him. When we pass him, he seems to go backwards. You sometimes hear people speak of two racehorses in this way. When the one behind begins to catch up the one in front, the latter is said to come back to the former, because this is how it appears to the jockey who is catching up, and how Mars appears to the swifter Earth. There is, however, one great difference between the two cases. The racehorses run on the same track, so that when one passes the other, they are very close together. Mars and the Earth are running on tracks separated by many millions of miles. At the moment of passing, we are indeed nearer to Mars than at other times, and occasionally excitement appears in the daily press about the event. But there is no real cause for excitement. On the night when we pass him, we are perhaps 100,000 miles nearer to him than on the night before or the night after. 
But what is that in 50 million miles? Right, uh, part four of this lovely record set. Uh, it's H.H. Uh, Turner, Professor of, of uh, Astronomy. He could almost be Professor of Poetry, couldn't he, at uh, Oxford University. I bet you never expected to hear so much poetry uh, when discussing the stars. But when you look up into the sky at night, it's, it's such a mystery there, isn't there? It, uh, it's inspired so much poetry. Well, wasn't that lovely? The stars, the stars, are madmen in the sky. No one knows the reason why. Thanks for watching. <laughs>